So why wind matters uh, to this not only energy economy, to the transformation of our energy system, but also I think what you will find, I hope, is that domestically wind has become a, a very attractive option as we think about the portfolio of energy solutions uh, for this country. And we in the wind energy program as part of ERE believe that wind energy has a role to play and, and, and it's my goal to share that with all of you. Folks have been trying to do wind energy for quite some time and at scales not that dissimilar from the scales that we see today. It may be difficult for the folks on either the television, uh, on live I mean, and on the back of the room, but this is a, an individual here showing you the type of scale. And that's not that dissimilar from the scale of the machines that you'll see today. And I'll have a few more pictures to kind of illustrate that a little bit. But what has changed, if you notice in the bottom part of the slides, is the, the rate of capacity of the machine. And that has really been delivered through innovation and ingenuity and how do we best harness that wind energy uh, and convert it into electricity. And just uh, three or so decades ago, you see sizes now that are somewhat uh, similar to those that you see today, a two and a half megawatt machine uh, being installed there in a contribution from the Department of Energy. And at the time, NASA was involved uh, in wind energy. Today, uh, wind systems look primarily like this. These machines are highly dominated by a convergence in architecture. And that convergence is your typical, th what we call the three-bladed upwind machine. And upwind, just as I'll mention that a couple of times, I mean that the machine is pointing itself into the incoming flow. And what you notice here is a couple of things that I think are of note as I kind of share some, some points here. Number one is mostly in the U.S., it may be dissimilar in other parts of the world, we install winds in a, in a large array, which typically we either call them a wind farm or a wind plant. So I'll be using those terms throughout. And they're taking advantage of not only the wind resource, but the topography that is out there. And these systems are installed in such a way that they not only maximize their, their energy convergence, but at the same time, you know, take advantage of the allotted uh, land that they are installed in. Today, we have about 8,200 uh, megawatts of install capacity. That's actually a, a significant change because most of that capacity has really occurred over the last decade or so. There, has, there was a big boom in the 80s, primarily in California. Then the industry became actually quite dormant as some of those incentives back in the 80s went away. And over the last decade, due through innovations, economics, and others, this industry has really uh, quite taken off. Today, uh, these systems in our office, I, I truly believe, as Edward alluded to, that the Department of Energy is all over the DNA of this industry, not only in the innovations that have allowed this growth to occur, but also with regards to some of the contributions around manufacturing innovation, control, sensors, all of the things that are inside these systems, which truthfully, I think most of you would agree, look quite simple. Uh, in terms of deployment. But I will share with you that within these systems, there's a significant amount of engineering and design that really have allowed this economic competitiveness to occur. As a fact about wind energy, a lot of people don't recognize these systems, as you'll see in a few slides, are quite large, and you've seen already. But they are delivered and operational for less than $10 a pound. If you think about it from consumers, how many things do we own at home that is really a ten dollars a pound? Nothing. Uh, if you, if you, so if you start thinking about not only a system that is designed to convert wind energy into electricity that has to be operational 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 20 to 25 years of design life, and then you think about doing that for ten dollars a pound, it really starts creating an environment in your mind that really kind of articulates how complicated it is to do. So the fact that we've done this, in my opinion, and the department has contributed significantly, is really uh, just amazing. For me, I should have shared this as a fun fact. I should have started with this. I've had the, the opportunity to be a part of this industry for two decades. And as, a, as an engineer, 
uh, and eventually as a manager of one of our national laboratories and now here at DOE for five years, it really has been not only remarkable to see that growth, I, I commonly joke with people that I got to be a part of WIN before it was cool because it's pretty mainstream right now and it's gone from Birkenstocks to suits. Uh, so it has really transformed over a rather short period of time, but it has been uh, a really a, a blessed opportunity to be a part of that. Bless you. Um, so why has this taken off so much in the United States? Well, it starts with the wind resource. Like any one of these technologies from what Edward was sharing, are things that you can cultivate from the ground, in particular to wind and other renewables, you're really trying to exploit the indigenous resource that is out there, right? And the United States, like many other countries around the world, is blessed with an abundant resource of wind. If you look from this uh, schematic of the United States, what you find is the darker the colors in blue, the more prominent throughout the entire year wind is available. So you'll see this band right between the center of the United States, right here, where the, a lot of wind resource is really there almost the entire part of the year. But what is the challenge of that is that not a lot of people live there. Most folks in the United States and many countries, I would argue, live in the coastal regions. And that's really driven by a lot of other conditions. But specific to the United States, about 50% of our population lives in a coastal state. And about 70% of our energy is consumed in a coastal state. So when you think about the United States from a wind perspective, lots of opportunity here. The question then becomes, how do we integrate it and how do we really deliver that power effectively. But in case of our office is what are the other ways that one could consider deploying wind to really not only take advantage of where the wind resource is, but now we have to start coupling it to where the population centers are. So when you look at an office like ours, primarily in the United States, the deployments have been on land, but now we're thinking about offshore. What can be done off the coast so you can maximize the proximity to those load centers? And again, I'll share a little bit about that. The last factoid I would share, and this is really why this industry and companies have decided to really set up shop or manufacture in the United States, is because it has such an abundant resource that wind, from a resource perspective, it will never occur, will not run out of wind. We're talking about 10 times approximately all of the energy that's delivered, there's there, the opportunity is there. So the question for us as an office is not only how do we continue to lower the cost, but how do we promote this, this technology as an option that can have a, a truly a significant part of our energy agenda and our energy mix. So we, you have to start with a, a, a dominant or predominant resource. And in the case of wind, that is definitely the case. Now, when we look at these opportunities, there are a lot of things that create challenges and really push the boundaries of innovation. As the industry has matured, a lot of things have occurred because you have to take advantage of economies of scale. And in the case of wind, I will talk a little bit near the tail end, economies of manufacturing. What you have found in this industry as a function of time is that wind systems continue to get larger and taller. And the reason is the higher you go away from the surface of the earth, the better the wind typically becomes. That's due to a lot of reasons from shear effects to things that, it, that really have created a strong push for creating the most reliable, cost-effective system at the highest elevation possible. But as you saw from the picture from the gentleman who happens to be going down the blade, complexities come with getting to those elevations. They may be in terms of transportation, in terms of the cranes and the infrastructure required to install these systems, to of course eventually the operations and maintenance of these systems. So all of these things have to really be thought of as you think about the entire wind energy system. Typically today, most machines are roughly about 80 meters in what we call hub height, which is kind of the center of that rotor. So right around here is what is occurring here. But we know through our own work and works that are happening globally, the machines that push 110, 140 meters are being drawn and pursued. Again, a continued pursuit to get into the highest elevation in the most effective, reliable, and safe way to harness that wind resource. Roughly, every one and a half or so meters per second on average, 
translates to about a penny, penny and a half of cost reduction. So it really kind of makes a difference. The question is how do we get there in the most cost effective and reliable way? So here's the story of the US and this picture has changed enormously over the last, like I said, handful to 10 years. And a lot of myths that have been created as a function of time are really somewhat demyths here by a slide of this nature. So what you find is that wind is, in essence, a fairly diverse national resource. Today, wind is installed in 41 states and is delivering 5.5% of all of the electricity that is consumed. But one of the things that is really interesting is that what you find, a lot of people don't know this, in over 10 states in our union, wind is delivering over 10% of their electricity. With some, as you see, primarily in the center, pushing 30 to nearly 40%. These are things that if we would have sat here a decade ago, a lot of people would have at least questioned, maybe even ridiculed, because how does one integrate effectively and reliably a variable source of generation. A generation source that utilities and operators did not become accustomed to, did not grow up with. A source that no longer has that authority for you to ask for more or less power. Mother Nature is now part of the equation. So the question is how does one provide these individuals with the kind of information that he or she needs to operate the system reliably and understand how sources such as the one that Edward alluded to and others, complement one another from an energy mix perspective. And those are some of the things that the department is doing as well. Now, I mentioned jobs. Similar to Edward's statistics, wind today has about 100,000 jobs. And as you'll find from this graph, it's actually decoupled from where the deployment is happening. What you find is there is a broad spread of jobs across the entire US. And we have over 500 facilities today that have decided in companies to be a part of this agenda. So we really are appreciative of this picture. And one of the reasons that I think wind is an incredibly attractive option, not only domestically from a wind resource, but also from a job creation, is unlike other technologies like TVs and other ones, these things are incredibly large. Transporting them is a big deal. And that transportation piece has created a counteracting effect on labor wages. So in some cases, it is not cheaper to make it in a lower wage, lower manufacturing cost place, Asia and others. It actually is an advantage to manufacture domestically. And I think anywhere that you find in the United States that there is a, a need and a want for wind energy intrinsically brings jobs with it. And as I alluded to, uh, over 100,000 jobs, which we think is a, it's a great statistic and a great trend. Now, we also reflect on the future. So the question is, how do we take the agenda of today and move it forward? What I tell folks in my office and across when I get to talk to folks, the agenda that got us to 5% is not the agenda that are going to get us to 10, 15, 20% that it may be. There are a lot of things, not only in the technology side, in the grid integration side, in the environmental side that need to be reflected upon to enable us to do this. And we have done so in this type of work, like many of our offices through analysis and others that really try to capture not only the economics, but the opportunity space for technologies such as wind and try to highlight some of the attributes of these technologies. In the case of wind, I already talked about wind resource. It is ours, it is, it is inexhaustible. But what we, what's also attractive about wind is it has a very low signature or footprint from an environmental perspective, right? No water consumptions and other things are attractive elements when we're looking at an agenda <laughs> that in my opinion will require some of these services from our energy systems moving forward. And this is some of the work that we've done in the department. When we quickly move into our department, our agenda has really been into these three categories. How do we enable the industry to continue to grow and stay competitive in a very globally competitive environment? How do we enhance our security and ensure that these assets are safe and operational and complementary to the rest of the portfolio? And how do we strengthen our domestic manufacturing? So I'm going to quickly walk you through those building blocks. Number one, we are no longer in the business of working on a wind turbine in isolation per, per se. There are companies like General Electric and others that do a great job in this. But what we don't need to necessarily understand that we're working is how do these machines work 
in a plant environment. The reality is that these machines have zero awareness, much like your vehicles of today when you're driving, of one another. But they don't have the sensory pieces like we do, like our eyes and our ears as we're driving. So these systems have to be smarter. So how do we inject smartness into controls and sensors and make sure that these systems are working in unison, organizing themselves in such a way that their cumulative output is more efficient? That's what we're doing under this particular initiative. The distributed wind market. Everything that I've been sharing so far primarily focuses on the bulk power system. But the distributed wind sector is an important sector. It's, it's important for your community, it's important for your off-grid applications, and for those rural applica applications where wind can actually provide significant amount of benefits. That's another sector, and how do we make this as competitive as possible? The last piece which I mentioned earlier was Block Island. The United States, for the first time just last year, installed its first offshore wind system off the coast of Rhode Island in a small island called Block Island. So now that this industry is beginning here, we believe, again, lots of opportunity, primarily derived by the significant amount of population and energy consumption amongst our states. The question for us is, how do we do this effectively and reliably and in a cost-effective way? Because if you own a boat, you know that surviving out there in the ocean is really, really hard to do. A lot of things work against you, as you can see here from this picture. And, and, and not to forget the responsibility to coexist with Mother Nature, right? We are exploiting Mother Nature from the wind perspective, but the question is how do we work with, in this particular case, the environmental considerations that were there before wind got there? How do we enable to, to work together, recognize and ensure that these systems do not have an adverse effect? We have a very strong portfolio in this area as well. And grid integration. I alluded to this uh, earlier. This source does not look like the traditional sources of generation, the base, what we call traditionally base load power. But what we have shown through a lot of the innovation, a lot of advancements in things like forecasting, sensors, et cetera, transmission planning, that you can have a significant amount of variable source of electricity in your system and operate it reliably and effectively uh, in many parts of our country. And of course, working in unison with a lot of the traditional forms of generation. Last but not least, manufacturing. We, we need to continue to take advantage of this transportation piece. We know that these systems are getting larger. We know that these systems are going to require continued improvements in materials, materials that are lighter, more cost effectively. How do we ensure that America continues to be competitive, competitive in this manufacturing sector is incredibly important. We're working very closely with sister offices around the building to look at innovations like additive manufacturing. How do we continue to push that boundary to ensure that our competitiveness stays? And again, I, I hope in the, in the brief remarks, uh, you learned a little bit about the industry. Uh, we believe that this industry, at least domestically and in many parts of our globe, has arrived. We believe that it can be a key part of the energy agenda moving forward. And we do believe that this is something truly domestic that we can take advantage of and continue to use as effectively as possible. So with that, I want to thank you all. I want to thank Laura and Lindsay and the rest of the team for their great work. These folks work really hard, so thank you.